Good morning and welcome to Northminster Presbyterian on this bright, sunshiny, summer, hot day. <laughs> Good to see so many, so many smiling faces out here this morning. I want you to have one, one else from the pulpit anyway, and that is uh, Man of Food Bank is always in need of your assistance. We have bags out there in Norfolk, so please grab one, take it empty, bring it back full, and we'll make sure it gets to the right folks. All right, are there any announcements from the floor? Okay, we have one. Um, Carol Waddell had the wonderful idea of, again, collecting tabs for Ronald McDonald. And we've already started collecting them, and we're thankful. But I went by Ronald McDonald this week, and I got a nice big house for you to put your tabs in. So, please bring your tabs. Thank you. Thank you, Carol, for the wonderful idea. So, the uh, soda can tabs? Yeah, any, yeah. Okay, yeah. any kind of pop, pull pop tops? Yes. Okay. Yeah, we don't want the can. Just the tabs. Just the tabs. Okay. Thank you. Uh, one, one more announcement. There she is. Uh, Pastor's Bible study uh, resumes this fall. If anybody is interested, please let Pastor Greg know. That way we can order the books necessary for the uh, the Bible study. And have no other announcements. Let's now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. <coughs> Blessed 
this gift that you have given us, Lord, so much so that now we return a portion of that gift to you in the form of our worship today. And so bless our time together, Lord. May it be honorable and pleasing to you, and most of all, may it bring glory and honor to your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. The call to worship today comes to us from Psalm 80. Give ear, O shepherd of Israel. Stir up your might and come to save us. Restore us, O God, our hosts, but your faith and honor we may be saved. Then we will never turn back from you. Give us life, and we will call on your name. Restore us, O Lord of hosts, but your faith and honor we may be saved. Let us worship God. see children this morning, although we're all young at heart, so if you are able to stand, please do for our opening hymn for the beauty of the earth.
Amen. Dear friends, take on the authority of Scripture. What God's Word says to each and every one of us. Since we have confessed our sins, we are cleansed from all unrighteousness by being wrapped in the robes of Christ's righteousness. As a result, His love, His Word is sure and steadfast. Receive the good news that you and I are forgiven people to the glory of God and His Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Hearing our faith now, we have the opportunity to say what we believe, so please stand if you're able for our Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead, and ascended into heaven, and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord? 
Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord? I have heard what the prophets have said, who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back those who prophesy lies and who prophesy deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams. They tell one another, just as our ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks rocks into pieces? Continuing now our New Testament reading, we're looking at the book of Hebrews this week. We're taking a break from the, from the Gospel of Luke, and we're dealing with the book of Hebrews. Hebrews chapter 11, I'll be reading verses 29 through the end of the chapter, and then reading the very first two verses of chapter 12. Don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. The author does not identify himself at all. But we know the book was addressed to the title, The Hebrews. And we believe it was probably written sometime in the late, middle of the late 50s to early 60s AD. It's written to the Hebrews. These are people who were Jewish and then they became Christians. They converted to Christianity to this new faith. But during that period of time, there was an emperor on the throne in, in Rome, the Emperor Nero, and a great persecution rose up against the church. So consequently, the people began to doubt their faith. And they thought, well, maybe, you know, we ought to go back to being, you know, good Jews and basically be left alone. And of course, as many people know, uh, Nero wanted to rebuild the, the uh, city of Rome. And so most historians believe he set fire to it in order to basically level the city so he could rebuild it. He actually made the claim that, you know, I found Rome in, built with wood and I left it built with marble. And of course, he blamed the fire on the Christians. Okay? They, and so consequently, they were under a great deal of persecution. So this book is addressed to them saying, don't go back, don't give up, keep the faith, hang in there. Yes, there's going to be persecution, but there's always going to be persecution in your lives. So consequently, he says, basically, don't give up. Be encouraged because God is with you in all of your trials and tribulations in life. And so it was a very comforting book to many of those people because, of course, many of them suffered greatly under persecution of uh, Nero. There were a number of persecutions in, uh, up in, for the first few centuries of the church. There was a great persecution under Domitian in the year, uh, in the 90s, as a matter of fact, during the period of time when John wrote the book of Revelation. And subsequently, whenever something bad happened in Rome, whether there was a famine or whether there was a war or a battle they lost or, or, or something or other, crop failure, you name it, blame it on the Christians. Okay, so there was a number of persecutions in the first three centuries of the church until finally Constantine, in the year 313, converted to Christianity. And from then on, the Christians could actually come in from underground, literally underground. They were worshiping in the sewers, in the catacombs. They could actually come up and become basically a respected religion in that period of time during the Roman Empire. Here now, the word of the Lord, uh, the book of Hebrews, Hebrews beginning chapter 11, verse 29. By faith, people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, and when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith, the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith, Rahab, the prostitute, did not perish with those who were disobedient, because she received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For time would fail me to tell of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David, and Samuel, and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fire, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death, they were sawn in two, they were killed by the sword, they went about in skins of sheep and goats, destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and caves and holes in the ground, yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised. Since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect, Therefore, 
since we are surrounded by so greatly cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. May God have lesson to the reading and hearing of his holy word. These are the words of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I held this sermon this morning running the race of faith. And of course Hebrews 11 is that great faith chapter of the Bible. I'm sure you've all read Hebrews 11, Faith's Hall of Fame, all these people in there. These people heard God's promises and believed them in spite of waiting a very long time, a very long time to have those promises fulfilled. Some of the promises were never even fulfilled in their lifetime. For instance, Abraham, we read about Abraham last week, when God promised that he would make his descendants as many as the stars are in the sky. When he took him outside, look at the stars, you can count them. That's what the number of your descendants will be, God tells Abram. And Abram's thinking, oh, wait a minute now, you know, I'm 100 years old. I don't have a descendant. One, my wife's 90 years old, and you're going to give me that many? Of course, he didn't live to see those, those, those descendants. He didn't live long enough to see the nation, the Jewish nation that sprang from that, from that first child, that Isaac. This chapter defines what is called the assurance of faith. The assurance. As a matter of fact, that word assurance means a certain thing. It's actually a Greek word, a hypostasis, and it means reality. It's real. There's no denying it. As, as they're opposed to things that are well, there's, is there proof of it? Is there certainty of it? Of things not seen. In other words, what, what they're saying here, it is believing without seeing. Believing without seeing. And so, of course, the author then relates to all these faith people in the Bible, whether it's uh, Abel and Enoch and Noah and Abraham and Sarah and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses goes through the whole litany of saints, Old Testament saints, and the trials and tribulations that they went through and never even received what they believed until many times their own death. You know, history is full of people who refuse to give up even when they're threatened with death. And God wants his people to have faith just like that. Even threatened with death. The old joke goes sometimes, and you may have heard it, that if you were put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Think about that. Are you guilty of being a Christian? Or would you plead not guilty? And there wouldn't be enough evidence to prove your faith, really. This faith, what is this faith we're talking about, really? Hebrews tells us here that they faced many trials and tribulations. I just read you the whole litany, the whole list of things they approached. These trials were not punishments from God, number one. They were not punishments from God, but they were evidence that God had taken away his protection in many cases. But those people were still strong in their faith, and yet in all those troubles, they knew that this life was not all there is. There was the promise of a better world, a better world to come. My friends, we all die. We all will die unless our Lord returns in our lifetime. But for those who die in the faith, die in the faith, our promises are guaranteed. Our promises are guaranteed. The reader is sometimes worried about threats of persecution so that the author encourages them to keep their eyes on the eternal. Don't be looking at the here and now, the temporary, because God has planned something better. God has planned something better. Not only for us, but for everyone who believes. Everyone who's. And so it's the same for us Christians 2,000 years ago. Anyone who said being a Christian is a bed of roses, I'd love to find out what bed they're lying in. <laughs> all right. It's not happiness all by and by, pie in the sky, once we accept faith in Christ. We do have tribulation. We don't, maybe, maybe we're not getting uh, you know, beaten and, and tortured and we're not getting sawn in two. <laughs> But the fact of the matter is that, yes, the Christian walk is, is, is not uh, an easy road to take, as a matter of fact. And our reading from Hebrews today is about running the race of faith, this title here, the running the race of faith, the endurance we need to finish the, to finish the race. To finish the race. The race is not easy, my friends. It may be tedious. There's going to be obstacles on the way. There's going to be things that slow you down. 
Yes, you will break into a sweat, okay? The race will require your sweat, your tears, and maybe even sometimes your blood. But God will provide you the endurance that you need. So you need to consider your Christian faith, your Christian faith like a marathon. A marathon, you know, a marathon's a long distance run. Uh, it's a race usually of 26 miles. I found it interesting uh, how that uh, 26 mile figure came up. It's actually based upon the Battle of Marathon. The Battle of Marathon, which took place in Greece in 490 BC, the Persians had invaded the Greeks, and the Greeks were able to take and unite the other city-states, mostly from the Peloponnesian and the Plataea, and they were able to take and defeat the Persians in 490. And consequently, there was, there was a, a runner, his name was uh, Philippides, and he ran from the battle scene at Marathon, the city of Marathon, all the way to Athens to tell the people that the Greeks have won. The Greeks have won. And then he fell over dead. <laughs> History tells us. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. No. Herodotus tells us that. He is a Greek historian. He's known as the father of history, but Herodotus is also known as the father of lies. So uh, we can't always take what he says. Thucydides is a better Greek historian. But the fact remains, the distance between Marathon and Athens was 26 miles. And so that's why today, when the modern Olympics came back in 1896, to this day, the marathon has run 26 miles. Of course, our Christian life was more than a 26-mile run. It's a slog our entire life. So how is our Christian faith like a marathon, more than a 26-mile marathon? Well, I think it began, my friends, when you accepted Christ's free offer of, of, of salvation and grace. And it doesn't matter when you came to faith in Christ. I, I said it before, but I believe that there are two, two, two types of Christians. Two types of Christians. I believe there are those Pauline Christians, those Apostle Paul type of Christians, who we read about in Acts 9 when the Apostle Paul was struck down on the Damascus Road. And of course, you know, who's persecuting you? Know, and sure enough, it's Jesus there. And Paul had that great conversion experience. Pauline Christians, and that's very good, they can name the date and the time and the minute that they accepted Christ as their Savior. Many of you might be Pauline and Christian. You might say, yes, I can tell you exactly when I decided that Christ was my Savior. And then there's the other type of Christians. There are what I, I call Timothy Christians. Timothy Christians are because uh, Paul talks about in 2 Timothy that Timothy had a Jewish father, but he was raised by his grandmother and his mother his grandmother's name was Lois, and his mother's name was Eunice, and they were Christians. And so they brought him up in the faith. And so Timothy always knew he was a Christian. There was not a time he could point to and say, well, this is when I accepted Christ. I think many of us may be Timothy Christians in here. We may have always known Jesus, all about Jesus Christ. I myself, I believe, am a Timothy Christian. There was never a time in my life when I never did not know that Jesus was my Lord and Savior. I just grew up in the faith. My parents took me to Sunday school. They took me to church. And there was never a time I can point to saying, this is when I could write in my Bible I accepted Christ. It doesn't matter whether you're a Pauline Christian or a Timothy Christian. The important thing is that you know Christ now as your Savior. Amen. Now. So our, great, our, our Christian journey is like a marathon. We run it no matter what time we came to faith in Christ. And we're going to run that marathon until the day we die. It's a journey that all believers are called to take and walk. Hebrews makes, makes reference here to this cloud of witnesses in chapter 12. We're surrounded by this cloud of witnesses. And I, and I looked a great deal about this cloud of witnesses. Just who are they talking about? Now some people will tell you that the cloud of witnesses are those saints who have gone ahead and they're in heaven right now and they're looking down on us and they're cheering us on and saying, run the race with endurance, run the race of faith, but I don't believe that. I don't believe that. Because what I understand in reading about heaven, there, there are no regrets in heaven. There are no tears in heaven. Heaven is a joyful, joyous place. My friends, if our departed loved ones could look down from heaven and see the things that we do, plainly the stupid things we do, and let's call it for what it is, sin in our lives, they would be ashamed of us, I think. And we would be embarrassed. I believe the witnesses referred to here are people that God has brought into our life and encouraged us in our own Christian walk. People who have come in and out of our lives, some of them may still be in our lives, some of them may have departed, but people 
who were great encouragers to help us along that journey. I think of my own life, for instance. I think of my pastor, Dr. Dr. Charles Norville, when I was little. He was the pastor of, of Kenwood Presbyterian Church for 27 years. He gave me a love of the Bible. A love of the Bible, the stories in the Bible. He married Judy and me, as a matter of fact. He baptized both our son and our daughter. And last year, at the age of 97, Dr. Norville went home to be with the Lord. But he was a powerful influence on my life. I think about, I think about my Sunday school teacher, Mrs. Olga Benson, <coughs> my Sunday school teacher, for about five years. She encouraged me with my love of reading. And believe me, I wasn't a good boy in Sunday school. You know, uh, I wasn't always, you know, uh, well, let's just put it this way, I, I repented of those sins. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is she had faith in me. She says, yes, yes, I can see something in you. And I can tell you some other people. My high school football coach, Mr. Walko, and, and my wrestling coach, Mr. Patrick. People that said, yes, you can do it. They were encouragers. They came in my life. And I think about my algebra and calculus teacher, Mrs. Martin. And man, did I really struggle in math. But she was a woman who would give an hour of her time after school. She says, yes, I know, Gregory. I know that you can master this. I know you can do this. And I did. And then there was my high school best friend, my best friend in college, and the best man at my wedding, as a matter of fact, Bob, who was a brilliant in, in, in calculus. I mean, he just it, he took to it like a duck of water. So many people who were great witnesses and great encouragers of my life that came into my life, and some of them are gone now. Like I said, Dr. Norwell was gone. I'm sure Mrs. Benson's gone. I'm sure my coaches are gone. I know my best friend Bob was gone. He died at age 57, as a matter of fact. Kind of early to be checking out. But you know, last but not least, the greatest witness in my life right now is what I can say is all I ever am or all that I ever will be is due to the 48 years that I've been married to my wife, Judy. That's a fact. The encourager, the one who was there with you in good times and bad that can still see you through. People who encourage you, people who cheer you. You can probably lose people in your own lives like that. God put them in your life for a reason, and they were there when you needed them. Maybe they're still there. Maybe they're, maybe they're friends of yours still, acquaintances, or maybe they're you no longer even know where they are. But that's a cloud of witnesses that surrounded us. Think back to your own lives. They were encouragers. They were cheerleaders, people who believed in you. And I think that crowd of witnesses is still with us today. When we read our Bibles, we read about the people of faith that Hebrews 11 just spoke about. And when we see what they went through, and of course, as I said, none of us are getting sawn in two, or none of us, I don't, we're not getting beaten or tortured for our faith. But yes, they endured it, and so can we. And that's what faith is. Faith is what we bear witness to today. It's what we see in the pages of Scripture. Don't give up. Keep in there. Because we're looking for something better beyond, something that is better than this world. We're just passing through. Yeah, we grow weary. Sometimes we feel like giving up. Sometimes we feel the weight of sadness and frustration. It seems like it's taking so long in many times. I don't always see my prayers answered. Life may be not going as I particularly planned it or hoped it. The Christian life, my friends, is not easy. It's based on faith. I keep falling for the same old temptations because, well, those temptations are so tempting. <laughs> Shouldn't ask about that. Am I some great overcomer that I, you know, I can triumph over the devil? Am I in the sinful flesh? No. All too often I give in, which sometimes can make me feel like giving up. But in your own life, what weighs you down? What are you slowing down to run the race? Or what are you saying that the finish line looks so far off? I'll never make it. I'll never make it. Keep in mind there's no shortcut in the Christian faith. Because we're at war with the enemy. And the enemy is always there trying to drag us down, trying to drag us down. And we know what it is. It's like an octopus. Sin is like an octopus that gets a hold of us with tentacles and tries to take and first grab you and pull you this way and pull you that way to pull you away from God. So anything that is not of the faith that you believe in, of course, makes you doubt. And when you doubt the promises of God, you can see clearly what happens. Friends, we are sojourners here, just like Abram was a sojourner in the promised land. 
He was given that promised land, but he did not get to see the fruition of what that promised land became, a great nation, the Jewish nation. We too are pilgrims, and we are strangers here. We are exiles, if you will, on this earth. This world is not our home. We're out of place here. We don't fit in. We may think we fit in, but if we think we fit in, then guess what? We're getting too comfortable with this world. And what is 80 or 100 years of our life? Yeah, maybe I, I'm going to live to be 100 years old, okay? So what? What is that 100 years in light of eternity? It's not even a drop in the bucket. We're people on the way, and we're on the way out, actually. We're not there yet. And we can't see with our eyes yet. But we have God's promises, and it is good. Actually, it is very good. It's better than gold. The psalmist tells us that, the promises. The promises of God conferred in Christ are never ending, for all of them are yes in Him. Now think about that. Christ is the one who shed His, his tears, shed His blood, shed His sweat for our salvation. At least we didn't have to go to the cross to live eternally. Think about that for a moment. Sweat poured from Jesus as he prayed for us in the Garden of Gethsemane. And blood. Think about how much blood our Lord shed. Not only was he flogged, okay, uh, but he had a crown of thorns on his head. And not only, not only that, he's on the cross after being nailed there, hands and feet. And a Roman soldier sticks a spear at his side. For without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. But with all of that, Christ came. Christ came for you and for me. And that's very humbling. The free gift, the free gift of salvation for all of the saints, for all of the saints. So my friends, it's all ours by faith. Faith engendered by the Holy Spirit. This faith takes hold of the promise. It comes by hearing the word and hearing the word through Christ. And yes, our faith is refreshed, I pray, every Sunday when the word is proclaimed here, when we read our Bibles, and yes, when we partake of that table. That strengthens our faith. The promise is yours, the inheritance is yours, and what an inheritance it is. Eternal life with Christ and with his saints. Just imagine, can you imagine hanging around with some of these people from the Bible? I mean, with Abraham and Sarah and Moses and David and Mary. I'd love to ask Mary what it was like on that first Christmas, that night when angels appeared and shepherds appeared and kings appeared and brought their gifts. And boy, the Apostle Paul, I can't wait to get a hold of him. Especially, uh, I have some questions from the Book of Romans. And there's Martin Luther there, working on him, maybe with J.S. Bach. Of course, when the angels want music, they ask for Bach. But there's God, maybe, saying, send me Mozart. I want to hear Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart. <laughs> Think of the people when you do it. And it sounds heavenly, and, and, and it really is. And then think of the loved ones that we have seen go before us. Our sainted grandparents, maybe our own parents if they're not alive now. No more physical ailments, no more disease, no more death, no more dying, no more sadness. All of that is gone because Christ said, I make all things new. Behold, I make all things new. It's going to be a wonderful, glorious family reunion. You see, these people have all crossed the finish line. They made it. They're wearing their white robes and they're wearing the victor's crown. And they're all singing hymns, of course, to Christ the King who made it all possible. They all died in the faith. They all died in the faith. Not having received the things promised, but the things better. They desired a better country, a heavenly one. And God has prepared that for them in eternity now. The joy that's set before us the joy that's set before us. And I love the way the author puts this. While we're running, we're fixing our eyes. We're fixing our eyes on Jesus, on Jesus himself, the author of our faith. He's the one there at the finish line saying, come on, come on. You can do this. You can do this. We can go confidently, holding on to that promise. It's a long haul. Yes, it's a marathon. The race we're running, there are no shortcuts, my friends. So friends, I ask you to examine your own life. Examine your own life. Only you can be true to yourself. Only you are the ones who live inside your own skin. Examples of success are all around us. We should get rid of anything that distracts us. I mentioned sin, for instance. Sin that drags us down. 
So in order to be faithful, we've got to put aside those things that are weighing us down. We can't run the race with endurance. We can't run that race with faith if we have baggage. We've got to get rid of that baggage, and that baggage is called sin. And we've got to look forward to that day. So let's run with perseverance the faith marked out for us. By keeping our eyes on that one goal, on that one goal, on Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. He's the only one who calls us to faith, if you think about it. The only one we can turn to. And yes, the only one who tasted death once and for all and came back to life. <coughs> His promises are true. It's only by faith. It's only by faith. Perseverance in that faith. That we can run that race with faith. And only by Jesus and His grace, dear friends. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Continuing our worship, from everyone who's been given much, much is required. So let us present our morning tithes and offerings to God at this time.
to be succumbed by the idols of power and money. We pray for disputes to end, for people to work together, and for peace. Peace in the world, Lord. Peace in our homes. Peace even in our troubled hearts. Lord, we lift up also your teachers this week as children return to school. We pray, Lord, that those educators will have enthusiasm and joy for the work that they do with the precious charge that you've given them, young minds. We pray for students, Lord, walking to school, standing on school bus stops, riding buses, and yes, Lord, even for safety within their classrooms. Lord, we think about the, the, all the natural disasters going on around the, the country. We pray for those affected by weather events and climate disasters, whether it's storms or, or floods, especially if we think about those folks in Kentucky, where the wildfires in the west, the drought and extreme temperatures caused by climate change. Lord, the weather patterns, the weather is not like this when, when, when I was younger. Things are changing. So, Lord, we pray for those relief for those people that are suffering from extremes you will. Lord, we pray for all those who are ill, those who care for those who are ill. Bless our doctors and nurses and, and, and medical professionals with reserves of strength and endurance and to use the skills that they have learned, Lord, to relieve and to heal and to help those who suffer. Bless patients filling our hospitals with healing and hope. Bless those working on behalf as we're still on and off with COVID. Build among us, Lord, a sense of mutual responsibility for the health and safety of each other. Let us look in upon our neighbors. Look upon those who may be elderly, those who may be uh, without caregivers, those that are lonely, and those that have distanced themselves from connection to society. Lord, we lift up the lonely and the forgotten, especially those who are widows and widowers. Lord, we pray for all who are afflicted by us, physical ailments, and especially those on our prayer list this morning. Give them a measure of your grace, your comfort, and your healing. Lord, release those who are held in bondage with various addictions. Lord, free them from that grip. We pray for members, Lord, of our church revitalization team. Give them the enthusiasm to work to discern the future ministry and mission of this, our Northminster Church. O oh God, your loving purpose, give us to be the answers to the prayers that we ask every day. Lord, we ask these prayers in your name. Unite as the family of faith and as the body of Christ, we lift these prayers up to you. God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer, remembering the prayer that you taught your disciples, our Lord's prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, our closing hymn is, We Walk by Faith and Not by Sight. Please stand for able for that closing hymn.
Friends, during this hour of worship, we have known forgiveness, we have known restoration, and we have known grace. Now we are sent from this place to share and to serve Christ's kingdom. May God, our creator, redeemer, and sustainer go with us, guiding and blessing us as we seek to be a blessing to others in the coming week. Amen. Receive now a benediction. Unto him who is able to keep you from stumbling and present you faultless before his throne with exceeding joy is the only wise God with glory and dominion, power and majesty both now and forevermore. And may that same God bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his favor upon you and grant you this day his everlasting peace. Amen. <laughs>